don't have great expectations here. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for the, uh, the very flamboyant uh, uh, introduction there, Mike. That was, uh, that was very good. I'll pay you later for that one. Okay, um, I did get the, the role as being lead trainer, and it's quite nice to see that there's, uh, there's quite a number of people in here who have been on training courses that, uh, that I have run. Um, most of the feedback has been reasonably positive. Whether that's actually true or not, it's just people being nice, I'm not actually totally sure. We do try to, to encourage people, for any of those of you who, are, who ha are here today, who have not been on a course yet, to give constructive feedback because that is the only way that we can really improve things. Telling us that we do an amazing job and yeah, we tick the box that that's the final part of your ABI process is one thing that we really want to see where the improvement can be made. That's really quite essential, that's for sure. Um, okay, let's move on. There was a little bit of repetition in, in my presentation uh, as what's also gone on in Mike's and a little bit with, with Chris, but it's just really because of the theme in which um, I'm, I'm coming from here. So, what's it all been about? So the scheme was launched in 2015, and from my own perspective and from a company perspective, we have uh, 10 ABIs who, who work for, for my company, Specialist Marine Consultants. It's been pretty successful. Uh, we adopted the scheme very much early on, um, and we continue to, to train inspectors through the process because we will only deliver a CMID that is, is completed by an ABI. Now, we, we made that more or less statement last year and, uh, and we've run with that. So anyone who has undertaken a CMID who wasn't an ABI will have only done it accompanied by an ABI, but it will be the ABI who writes the actual report which goes back to the client because we respect the client. At the end of the day, without the clients and the customers, none of us will, uh, would be here. So the numbers going through the system have been pretty steady, um, as, uh, as Mike said at the start of this. Uh, I remember going on the actual, the very first course, which, which Chris ran, that was up in, uh, in Aberdeen. And, um, you know, at that point, I think one of the questions which was raised to Chris was, how many people did we expect? And I think, Chris may correct me here, uh, on the actual IMCA database at that time, was there something like 1,500 registered companies? Something around that number. And I was, you could kind of knock me down with a feather because I was like, Jesus Christ, you know, what do we do? One boat each a year or something like that. Um, and I was quite surprised at that. Uh, I originally went through the Irvid process and did the course back in 2010, never inspected a vessel, and uh, was kindly told by Irvid that I was no longer required. Uh, so I think other people have probably found as well. Um, so we, we, I, I thought then, is this going to be something which could run out of control? And I put a figure in my head thinking that I thought it would probably bottom out around about 400 people-ish, something around about that. And we've got to 257 now. Um, I think you've still got a fairly, uh, fairly steady increase of people which are coming through the scheme. So that's, that, that's pretty good. And I think the uptake as well, which has been for the courses, has also been good. Uh, the courses, certainly which, which I run, uh, we try to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, there's Andy over there, he was on one of our last courses and we sort of changed it around quite a bit. And we are trying to make it more workshop based so people are actually focusing on what's going on with the document and how they will approach the questions and how you'll answer the questions as well stating fact rather than fiction. You know, we, we, we see a lot of CMIDs which come through the process that start to go into waffle and start to go into Ianisms or Davisms or Yanisms or whatever and not actually stating the fact. Whether it's fact about that there is actually no finding or it's fact that there is a finding and this is what's wrong. And also, not telling them how to repair it or to fix it or to put it right. That's not our job. And that's quite an important part to put across because you can go lead into liability as well. You know, we went away from the word recommendations some time ago because it comes with it huge liability. If you recommend something to somebody, 
they do it, it goes wrong, they can come after you. So that was something which was certainly changed. Um, I can't remember, it was maybe version six that recommendations were taken out. I think the, the old um, MISW, uh, which was in portrait style, had recommendations written in it, and that was something we used to, uh, to delete and change. So, we face some challenging times, and that's something I'll talk about in a second. Um, as we've seen, certainly with the oil and gas activity, which is depleted globally, uh, which has resulted in obviously huge amounts of vessels being taken off the market, resulting in huge amounts of vessels not requiring inspections. But there are emerging markets. Um, it's great to see that we've got Mike here from Vattenfall, uh, from the renewable, spe renewable sector. It's a sector that we're heavily involved in. And it's been a lifeline, certainly for us as a business, that's for sure. Had we not got into the renewable market, I wouldn't have been stood here today, that's for sure. I'd have probably been back at sea if anybody would have had me. Um, and the signs of growth globally, it's not just, I think we, we tend to maybe lose focus uh, because IMCO we tend to view as being a Northern European thing. It's not, it's global. Uh, and one point I think which comes about with the EC mid is where we want 24 hour access to the EC mid. That's also important if you are traveling down to Australia for my sake to do a job or Singapore, the time difference there obviously prohibits what access you can actually get to poor old Ryan because he's on his nine to five and that's something I think that will becomes an improvement. But with the emerging markets, um, certainly renewables, which broaden out to Canada, Taiwan, the US, China, aspects of the Mediterranean, I say that is an emerging market for us all to, uh, to certainly look at and focus on. And I think one of the other things as well is because we've got ABIs, which are both based regionally, it's, it's a big, big, big help. Um, Ursula, who's going to do a, a presentation on DP, which I'm very much looking forward to. I did see an earlier one at one of the trading sessions, and she was very, very good. So I'll big you up now, Ursula. Um, so I don't disappoint. Is that the database does work? Ursula commented this morning at breakfast that she'd had, I think, three inspections had come through from being called off the database because geographically, where she is based in Malta, it was one a cost saving for the, the, the client, the customer, because she's there and doesn't need to travel. So that part of it as well is working for us. Uh, ourselves have had it where we've had some of our own inspectors have been called and then it feeds back through us as a company. So yeah, that as a marketing aspect is certainly very positive. So, uh, you know, we do take that on board. So the whole process is quite rigorous. Um, from your application, for all of you who have gone through the application process, to going through the assessment process, and maybe not quite getting what you want. Uh, I know this, the, the, the assessment rate has been quite good. Uh, there's been a fairly low failure rate. However, I think there's a slightly higher rate of where people have not got all the vessel types that they wanted. And there's a reason for that. It's basically because the objective evidence hasn't been put forward and could not be verified. And we owe it to our, our clients and customers that if you have been accredited for those things, then they know that you are competent at doing it. It doesn't detract from the, the ability for you to continue to go through the process and then gain accreditation on those elements at a later stage. So that is, uh, is certainly a flexible part, uh, a part of it. So, without giving too much away by the image, what was it really all about? Well, for me, the whole thing, and I think I answered the question to Chris uh, when he asked it back in September 2015 uh, in Aberdeen, was it was to raise the bar, to raise the standard. If you go back pre-2015, sort of when, this, when this was around, effectively anyone, given the acceptance from 
the paying customer who commissioned the inspection could literally undertake an inspection. There was no policing process there. You could register on the database. There was no real checks to say that you were registered or anything about that. So that was, that was out there. So getting this process started and getting the ABIs running through it was for me a massive standard razor. Okay, getting the bar up so that to kind of phrase, you know, to sort the wheat from the chaff, it was because we have you know, a small number of people who have accreditation for all points. Peter sat at the back, I know he's got everything. We'll give him a round of applause later. Um, but they're not a huge amount of people who do have everything. I've got everything apart from LNG because I really know nothing about LNG. But the only time I use gas is to light a barbecue. Um, but it's getting the, the inspectors, getting you the recognition that you deserve. So if you go through the process, you are accredited, you have something that you can market with, you have something that you can take to your customers with, and you have to self-promote it. We have to hope that our customers will take that on board. And that's something which will be reiterated through this presentation a couple of times because we have to get the buy-in. It was interesting when um, Mike gave his introduction to say that Battenfall were doing that, that they were using on the ABIs. And that's very, very credible. And I think that's something I would say to all the IMCA members who are vessel operators, people who are commissioning inspections, to do the same thing. Support their own organization, support the actual scheme, because ultimately it was them who really wanted the scheme to kick off to start with. So getting that support is, is absolutely essential to the success of the scheme. So that's something that we all need to try and push wherever we can do to promote ourselves. Very, very important. So to your customer, having a vessel inspected by an ABI should give them a little bit more peace of mind to say that this person has been through an accreditation process and all that in essence should feed back to the customer's uh, quality management systems, safety management systems, because it all falls in part of due diligence as, uh, as we move forward. So again, it's self-promote yourself, get the fact out there that you are an ABI, get it on your websites, get it on your CVs, get it on your promotional documentation. It helps. And I think our customers, you know, certainly do like it. I'm not saying at the moment they're going to be willing to be paying for it. Uh, but it's something which we hope will help certainly promote the whole thing as we move forward. So again, just a little bit of repetition on the story so far as we've really seen it. 257 accredited AVIs, 300 people, 300 I think through the process? Yeah, 300 through the process, and there's the 238 which have gone through the courses, there's quite a number of those, have gone through which haven't gone through the ABI process yet. So hopefully those people will come in and it will increase, um, increase that number. Because one of the things that we, we have to be, I think, very much wary of, and it's something that uh, the numbers were discussed at, at dinner last night, is what's the average age of a vessel inspector? I'm 51. Okay, I know I don't look it, but um, I am. Uh, I had a very easy paper round, so that's uh, uh, why I've, I've enhanced these looks. Um, but certainly, the, the last the last course I ran, I think we did a, a general round the table. We didn't ask what people's ages were, but basically speaking, everybody on the course was certainly above the age of fifty. Um, and I think I'll speak for the UK alone. The number of uh, UK residents who are actually going to college to train in maritime skills, certainly to go to be a chief engineer or, or lead the field to go to be a master, is very, very slim. You know, I couldn't name a single person that I know who's been through to qualify as master in the last five years. So we have a fairly depleting skill set. And that's something that in terms of training and how we can bring people on is, is really quite essential. 
And we also have to look to our customers to assist us in that because we are going to have to bring younger blood into it and we're going to have to hope that our customers will help us bring that into it because otherwise they're going to hit a, a, a hard place as well. Without inspectors, you've got no inspection regime. And uh, it's, it's very easy to sit here now and think, yeah, okay, well, we've all got a good 10 years left in us. What happens after 10 years? Because there'll still be a marine industry here in 10 years, in 20 years, in 100 years. Is it going to go the same way as that the, the marine side has gone, where we have to look further afield for, for officers? Is that going to be the case for inspectors as well? In which case, it would make it certainly quite expensive in Northern Europe, probably, for bringing inspections uh, to be carried out. In terms of people who have dropped out of the scheme, I think there has been a mixture of, of reasons for that. One, of course, is a downsell in the oil and gas sector. Uh, two is there is an age issue. People have retired, just more or less called it a day. I know when I ran a course um, in Singapore last year, there was a couple of people who were, uh, who were on that course. They'd more or less gone through the first year of accreditation and they were crediting for the last year because they'd done so little work. It was just, well, we'll do it for this one year, run the two years, and then we'll more or less call it a day because we don't see, not the value in, in, in the course, but just there isn't the work and they're not prepared to, to fight for it anymore. So I think the, the, the downturn has probably been prompted earlier retirement, people just physically dropping out because they've, they've had to look for alternative sources of employment. And um, yeah. Others have just drifted away from, from the inspection process altogether. But we have got good, strong candidate bases in Northern Europe, uh, in the US, particularly in Asia. I think Asia is probably the biggest region next to Northern Europe, isn't it? Um, where we have um, numbers of AVIs. And fortunately, we also have um, some very good local trainers down there as well, which can facilitate uh, the courses uh, uh, to be run, certainly very professionally. Um, in terms of courses, uh, Mike did touch on that earlier. We've got a number of courses uh, which will run this year. I think I've got two which I'm doing. I won't tell you which one, so anybody who hasn't done it yet doesn't grasp to jump and pick on me. Um, but if you haven't done the course yet and you are an ABI, please get on and make use of that two years and uh, make sure you go through the full process. Not a great picture, challenging times. Um, huge amounts of vessels in warm stack, cold stack, going to scrap. When I put this, this presentation together, I was actually gonna grab some of our people out of our office and line them up and put them next to this. Because for every vessel groups that are stacked up, there's also quite a number of inspectors who have nearly being stacked up. I won't say we've all been put into cold stack, but um, certainly a warm stack, I think, has, has, has been the case because there has been a massive, uh, a massive reduction, certainly since 2014. It couldn't have come at a worse time for, for the ABI uh, initiation. Uh, well, I think Chris and Mike both said we'll initiate a scheme to uh, to, to kick into the market just as uh, uh, oil collapses. And uh, yeah, that was just unfortunate. But what I will say is that I think the way IMCA and IIMS have responded to it, I remember having discussions with, with Hillary um, last year when people were coming up for reaccreditation and were saying, look, people are not physically going to be able to get two vessel types. It's, it's a virtual impossibility. So IMCA and IMS's response to, to building the flexibility, I think, has been very, very credible. That they will allow other forms of evidence to be supplied, um, whether it's been other types of inspection, suitability, warranty, QHSE, management inspections, or just the proof of evidence that you were still active within the marine sector, I think is really, really admirable. Admirable, because it keeps the scheme going, it keeps us going, and it is basically the scheme reacting to the nature of the industry. 
And that is something that we certainly need to have. And I think that flexibility, I think for me, certainly has, has been greatly welcomed, that's for sure. So with the large numbers of vessels laid up, certainly a lot less requirements. Hopefully we see things start to pick up in the, in the oil and gas sectors, um, which will help a huge number of people, certainly through this year, if things warm up a little bit on that side. The renewable sector, thankfully, has really got its teeth into, into things and there's certainly a good pipelines of work for the next five, 10 years uh, in new projects, particularly in the UK, aspects of Germany, um, here in the Netherlands, of course, with the Barcella projects, and France as well. Uh, that's let alone the, uh, the, the Taiwanese, the Chinese, the US, and potentially Canada as well. So again, that emerging market is certainly coming up. And I think the points which, which Chris made in his presentation of bringing in other vessel types um, also will help us. You know, we, we've got to react to where the work is and see you know, what we can deliver. Uh, we've got huge amounts of skills. I think the, the offshore industry is probably, you know, anybody who comes directly from the merchant side, don't shoot me down in flames here, but it's probably the highest police and one of the highest safety conscious quality uh, assured sectors of the marine sector. Certainly from my experience of it, um, I, I would say it is. So that is something which is, uh, uh, is really positive. So with the challenges, again, um, we've seen people drop out and, you know, I think we'll probably see some people drop out this time around, but hopefully they get replaced as well with some, some new blood coming into it. And I think there's probably be a little bit of a rush as we get towards uh, January when the, uh, the cut-off dates uh, come in. So uh, we would expect uh, certainly to see that, I think, as we, uh, as we move on. Just a, a little bit on the layups of, uh, of vessels there, which I wanted just to bring in to uh, totally demoralize everybody uh, before you have a coffee. Um, this is, I won't say totally up to date. Um, I tried to get it as up to date as I could using Clarkson, Seabrokers, uh, <coughs> and West Shore. But 1,466 vessels recorded as being laid up either in a warm, cold stack issue. Um, certainly if you go into the, into the Far East, down to Singapore, Batam, it's just completely stacked out with, uh, with vessels. And uh, I flew over <coughs> Norway, heading north um, up to Hammerfest, uh, latter part of last year, and it was an amazingly clear day. Uh, and about every nook and cranny that you flew over, there was some kind of offshore vessel tied up there. I think one of the most bizarre sites was actually um, just outside Bergen, um, Petroleum Geo Services, which have the Ramform seismic vessels. They had four stacked in there. It was like pieces of the, you know, the chocolate bar Toblerone. It was sort of wedged in together, sounding kind of, kind of like a mosaic, um, which uh, looked quite good from the sky, but not if you're PGS, that's for sure. So we've got a, a broad spectrum there. When things do pick back up, and there's a number of some of these vessels which are now starting to come into other sectors, particularly the renewable side, uh, there's quite a number of good quality DP vessels that are being converted to SOVs uh, with walk to work systems. Uh, I think that presently on the market, there's about 35 vessels, and about 25 of those have basically been mobilized out of the oil and gas sector. And I think we'll certainly see more of those to come. We're also starting to see more platform supply vessels be used as shuttle vessels in that sector as well. So that also, we hope, will, will reactivate things. So um, there's little positive steps there, uh, which, are, which are good. But in, in fairness, of the 1,466 vessels, there's going to be a high percentage of those will probably never return to active work. I think that's, that's something which is a given. You know, I've spoken to a number of brokers and the, the range can be anywhere between 30 to 40% of those vessels will probably never go into, uh, into an active situation again. So that's a little bit of a downside there. However, if we can get a thousand of those vessels back to work, that's a huge amount of inspections which are going to be there as a target market. 
and of course there will be new vessels being built. There is a lot of that tonnage which is old, needs to be replaced and for various reasons was inefficient, um, probably dirty and, uh, and will improve the situation. Okay, you're looking at that thinking, I just put some text on a slide. Well, I didn't write it, but. Um, and all of you read that, if you can. Well, the old man there is saying, sun after raking and bagging the leaves, clean all the dead plants off the hillside, then we'll see what else needs to be done. <clears throat> I know it's hard work, but you'll learn a good lesson from it. And the son replies, yeah to live in a condo where someone else does all the work. Okay. So during the, um, the workshops, we certainly encourage all the groups to be as interactive as possible. And if anybody's got questions, you know, at the end, we will we'll certainly take those. It's, impo it's important to learn from each other. You know, none of us know everything, that's for sure. Uh, I remember once, uh, I've done it a couple of times, acted as an expert witness uh, in, in a couple of uh, court cases. And uh, I always smile when they say, you know, this is the expert coming on. You know, to me, that is uh, total crap from my respect, because uh, uh, I'm certainly no expert, that's for sure. Uh, when I say I've met a lot, I've probably not met many, that's for sure. Um, so learning is, is a major thing, and certainly with the workshops, that's been given a fantastic networking opportunity to bring a huge amount of inspectors together from various different backgrounds where we can all feed off each other. We all do things in general in the same way, but there's also quite a lot of differences, and I think that's something that, uh, that I've found has been really encouraging. I've certainly learned a hell of a lot uh, whilst delivering the courses from people who are there. And that's something that I, I certainly look forward to when I'm delivering the courses uh, uh, now and certainly in the future. We have some key points that we, that we sort of learned from, uh, from the courses because we always ask people to either write down on the feedback sheets what they thought of the course or if they've got some key questions that they want to bring out during the course. If it's something that we can't answer, we will take it back, whether it goes back to IIMS and then it's folded onto to Chris or someone. Uh, that wasn't me, by the way. Um, is, is, is basically how it, how's your video, sorry. No, it's fine, you've got the lines joining you. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> You're gonna self-destruct in five seconds or anything. Right, okay. Um, yeah, so we, 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 um, we look at where we, what we can learn from. And the points which really come up, are, I've got a list of them here, which was also, I was helped with by, uh, by Hillary because uh, we send them through to Hillary and then she has to collate them and I forget about them all. And the database is, is something which has, has been fed back. It was encouraging to, to, to hear from Chris. It'll be also interesting to, to see what Ryan has to say when, when he comes on next. Um, is that how the, the whole system comes together? And I think it was interesting, I think it was Jens who mentioned the question that he had to do three paper copy audits because they couldn't get uh, the vessels registered. That actually happened to us as a company on Friday. We got a call at 20 minutes to five Friday afternoon, which is a great time to get a call wanting an inspection doing. The vessel wasn't registered on the system. Um, and subsequently, we had to then carry out a paper inspection, which is actually being carried out today. It's an MISW. It's not such a big issue. We can put it onto the system electronically at a later stage. but um, it's the speed to react. And I think it's something which has been raised by a couple of questions, uh, certainly to Chris, is that we certainly see practically a lot of our vessel inspections, we get two to three days notice on. And then the vessels are either already chartered, are going on higher, or are subject to going on higher, literally as the inspection is being done. So we have very little breathing space in between that time. And if it occurs where it's over a weekend, and there isn't that 24-7 backup, then it is a knockback on the system. 
and that's just one of the lessons which which has certainly uh, has certainly come out. Um, the knowledge base which we now or I'll certainly say from the courses which I've just done recently they're trying to focus on is something which we've also learned. Uh, there's a comment made I think about the ISM and knowledge in, in the Far East. That's something which was um, I was a little bit disturbed at that there was certainly significant lacks of knowledge in certain geographical areas particularly around the ISM code and for any of you who haven't done uh, the AVI course yet there is a Anybody here who's doing the course tomorrow? Oh, we've got some, yeah. Pay attention to the course because there is an exam at the end. Okay. Now, I think we've had five people, if I'm correct, out of 237 who've got 100%. Okay. I wasn't one of them. Um, but the questions were really hard on the first course, and we've actually made them a little bit easier <laughs> since then. <coughs> so... Uh, so that was just one of the things so yeah but there are some ism orientated questions and i think what we've seen is as well in the far east particularly that some of those questions are answered really incorrectly and so keeping up to speed with things and that's not just a dig at the far east keeping up to speed with with regulations and if imca can can assist that with different safety flashes which can be fed through the uh, the uh, database that's great because again we all have busy lives you know, we're trying to win work, we're trying to do the work, and keeping up to speed in regulations and the changing complexity of it is sometimes quite difficult. Okay, but it is something that we try, need to try and do to certainly enhance the quality that we put out to our customers. Um, the feedback also from, uh, from a lot of the courses uh, will go into uh, the version 12, uh, 149 or ECMID and um, the version 4 MISW. So your feedback is, is being used, it will be taken on board and you'll hopefully see that come out in print at a later stage when, uh, when those documents are delivered. So the future. Particularly use that vessel because it's one of the new vessels which has come into the market, um, operated by Eidersvik. And again, it just shows that although the vessel operators have taken a beating, you know, I know a lot of us think we've taken a beating as well, but you know, I haven't got a 200 million pound loan on a vessel which has to be serviced. Uh, a lot of these guys have got that and a hell of a lot more. So we, we have to give them uh, certainly the respect that they're due. And it's great to see that there are still new, new, new innovative vessels coming out there, which are greener, leaner, meaner, and uh, they will need inspections. Oil and gas will recover, that's for sure. How long it will take to recover, we don't know. Renewable sector will continue to grow. There will be other opportunities, so we have to stay focused, we have to stay positive. You know, there is a good future ahead for us, but we also have to bring in that new blood. We have to start to train people and we have to get training regimes uh, up and running in our companies wherever we can do and certainly encourage that too. The quality that we deliver in our inspections is absolutely integral to, to the success of the scheme and also the success of the individuals, whether you're a, a one-man company or you're a, a large organization. The quality, I believe, is the thing which will always sell you. If you can deliver that product, then the rest will look after itself. I'm not saying that people walk around handing you work out willy-nilly, of course they don't. We have to be competitive, but we have to be competitive with quality at its action works up as it's up most. And I think one of the foundations for that, and um, which is put out within the in the AVI course are the foundations on which the CMID process basically is built on, which is integrity, fair representation, professional care, independence, and confidentiality. And for those of you who haven't done the test yet, remember those points, and you've only got another 13 to get right. <laughs> Sticking with the facts, 
is something I really hammer home in the courses. Be informative, don't write an essay, deliver what is required so the person reading it can clearly understand what the positive element is on the vessel, where the negative elements are on the vessel, and particularly if it's a finding, be precise in what the finding is. That's what the customer wants to see. They don't need to know how long it took you to get there and what a bad night's sleep you had and everything else mixed into the findings. They want to know what is potentially wrong and what is also right because you know the findings are there because there is potential deficiency but the rest of the document should also highlight the positives you know i know when i was master at sea or chief mate as well with it when we used to get documents on board when we got the the surveys uh, back to us it was quite nice to read something good what we were doing whether we had a great permit to work system whether our confined space entry procedures were really good whether we'd run a drill and it came out that it was it was quite good. It was quite nice to get that third party feedback coming in. And uh, it also helps relax the marine crew for the next time that they go through an inspection. You know, I remember being inspected when I was at sea by some people who walked on board and thought they were God and expected to be treated that way. I've certainly never done that when I've done a, an inspection. And I think uh, the better that you can gel with the marine crew, the more that you get out of the marine crew. You know, we expect we inspect with our eyes and ears. We see what we see and we hear what we hear. We are there to take a snapshot in time on that vessel. And uh, that's the important thing. So how do we move on with the future? Well, deliver the quality, be competitive. And we also hope that our customers will use the AVIs. There's still a large amount of people who are out there who are very good inspectors who may have not gone through the process. And I would say to all the customers, if that's the case, then push them forward for it. We're not saying don't use those people anymore. Get them through the scheme and, uh, and let's get the good, people, uh, the good people in there. So to summarize, you know, remember where we come from. It's, it's very important. A couple of years ago, we had no accreditation scheme. Now we have one, which is up and running. And Mike said, yeah, we're a, a, a number of an elite. I think there's 7.5 billion people presently in the world today, and you are 257 of them. So I'd say that's quite elite. My wife would probably disagree with that, but uh, <clears throat> I try and tell her that I'm elite every now and again. And raise the bar, raise the standard, fly the flag. Are we not good at what we do? Yes, of course we are. We've been assessed, we've been told we're good at what we do. And that's something that we need to project going forward into the future and get that through to our clients. If we do that enough, they will use us and they will go away from using the cheaper alternatives. We've still got some tough times ahead. Oil and gas isn't gonna suddenly go to $120 a barrel tomorrow. I think we have a gentleman here from Shell. I'm sure he would love to see that. Um, but we will hopefully see pickups in that. And as we see the pickups in the price, we'll see the pickups in the vessels going back into the market. So we might not be through the toughest bit yet, but we're certainly going out of it. And again, with a renewable market, which is growing and ever increasing with more technical vessels and vessels which have been picked up out of the oil and gas sector, take that as a positive. Uh, there are still quite a number of new vessels being built into that sector as well. So it is certainly a very, very good emerging market. I think we will need to see some changes. Um, I think it's really reassuring to see uh, what Chris put up on the uh, the last slide there about the improvements which are going to be made to the new uh, CMI ECME e document. Slap on the wrist there for saying the wrong thing. Um, 
and he was he gave me a precursor to that while we're having breakfast and from my own point of view when i'm carrying out a cmed and it's a question that I'll, I'll sort of throw out there. Possibly, uh, I would like an answer from some of the people who may pay for a CME to be done. Is how long should it take? Don't all answer at once. You can. Uh, full working day. So we're talking 12 hours. Eight to 10 hours. Any advance on eight to 10? Take the man in the corner. 24 hours contact time. That's a very good answer, Suja. Are you running for Parliament this time, Brown? <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, that was great. That. <laughs> yeah, it, it's. It's a good point, and it's, it's, it's a question that comes up in literally every course that we run. How long should we take? And the, the, the bottom line is, you know, I, I will never answer it. I would always turn around and say, at least a day. Depending on the condition of the vessel, depending on what you find, depending on the crew, there's, there's a huge number of things. Um, I mean, one of the things which you probably all find, for those of you who are inspectors, that a high number of inspections are carried out on crew change days, on mobilization times, which is the worst possible time to do an inspection. Because if you're doing it on a crew change, the crew who are going off really can't be bothered to speak to an inspector because they've got one thing on mind, getting off the ship, getting home. The crew coming on board have just probably traveled from wherever, quite tired they need to re-familiarize themselves with the vessel they may have startup meetings they may have client meetings and god knows whatever else and they, they don't i would say they don't want to be cooperative they possibly are less cooperative so that can also throw delays at us you know how many times do you start to work through section five and section six and get several folders dumped on your desk to say, here's a safety management system. There it is. Paul's waving there, yeah, I'm sure you've had that done to you, Paul. Did I do that to you when I was, when you inspected us, you see? Uh, <laughs> and how many times you get a certificate folder dumped on you and a crew folder dumped on you? You know, and all that time is, is time to process. Fortunately, we, with the certificates and the crew side going to be taken out in the new versions, that to me is a huge step forward within the document. Because a lot of the, the work which can be done, certainly in certificates, even if you were still checking them and doing random checks, you can do via remote means using Equasis or Class Live and, and, and various other means. But I think for, for the time aspect of being able to physically get into the vessel, removing those two parts and allowing you certainly more time because we are constrained by time and constrained by time that our customers want to pay for it's no offense to any of the customers who are in the room but budgets are quite tight and we, we have to be able to respond to that and without delaying operations and delaying vessels but we need to deliver that quality of service so you know when you think about how long it takes to do it to me, it takes as long as it does to deliver a quality inspection. And if for whatever reason that you only have a fixed time to actually undertake the vessel and there are parts of the inspection that you can't physically get round, then register them. You know, don't compromise your own quality because you've been rushed and just make up some fictional answer or skirt through sat parts of the boxes there clearly state we ran out of time we couldn't do this we couldn't get action to the engine room because there was work going on those sort of things because that's the the quality that we want to run to and maintain so just to finish up on that well i would like to certainly thank um hillary and mike for uh, <coughs> for asking me uh, uh, to present here today. 
I uh, hope you all get something out of uh, the, 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 this uh, conference today. I think it's going to be interesting to certainly hear some of the speakers on some of the specific areas of the CMID, uh, certainly with Ursula and Suji who are doing those. So uh, for those of you who are inspectors, I would certainly take notes over those because uh, I think those will be uh, will certainly be very, very interesting. But I think one question uh, which I just want to pose to you as well, and it's uh, one of the kind of famous interview questions is, where do you want to be in five years' time? I want to be retired. Um, and I may be, you know, I may be retired uh, by someone else. Um, but I'm just coming back to the, to the youth sector and that we have to look at ways of how we can bring more, more youth into this industry. And that's not just as ABIs, but it is the entire marine industry per se. Uh, certainly the renewable sector, we've got a lot of young guys in there, young technicians and people, but again, the, the marine side of it still is fairly depleted with a lot of uh, older, long in the tooth people like me. Some who probably have not got any teeth left. Um, so we have, to, uh, we have to certainly focus on that. So, as I say, to all the ABIs out there, stick with it. It certainly is uh, improving. We will see improvements. We will see more vessels. And to all the customers and the clients, the vessel operators, when you're commissioning an inspection, make sure they've got an ABI number. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we need to crack on because we're a little bit over time. Sorry, so. I overshot. No, that's fine. Thank you. You can do questions on the panel.